this new study out. And here in Montana, you know, we've got the worst, some of the worst suicide rates in the nation. Uh, and we know that there that there have been cases here in in Montana. And I, think, and I think this is very close to home to some people. Um, that that there's been kind of a link between social media use. You might even say social media bullying. There's been a link between social media use uh, and depression, and a link between social media use and, and possibly even suicide. Well, there's a new study out now that says that there's a link between social media use and depression, and that it's stronger in teenage girls than it is in boys. Joining us now to talk about that, neuropsychologist Dr. Michelle Bankson on the show with us. Uh, doctor, thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, what's your read on this latest study? You know, Aaron, I think that there's a couple things going on. While in general, females do endorse depression more than males, I think we have to look at the difference between how males and females use social media, especially in our teens. You know, boys get on things like YouTube because they want to figure out how to master the game that they're playing. But girls get on social media, especially Facebook and Instagram, which is very picture-driven. So their self-esteem is all wrapped up in likes, comments, and shares. That's going to impact their self-esteem, which can lead to depression. So we all, and I think everybody suffers from this a little bit. You know, it seems like everybody tries to make their life look perfect and so great on Facebook. You know, and, and you might pull up Facebook and all of a sudden you see, it seems like everybody's in Hawaii, but you, well, we're stuck back here <laughs> yeah. in the snow. And so if you think about that, but from a teenage kid's perspective, uh, everything gets magnified, uh, you know, for, for kids even worse than, than the adults have it here. It really does, and it comes back to the fact that comparison is the thief of joy. And with social media available 24-7, there is a constant pathway to comparing our lives to others. And what's so funny is the same people who are really trying to perfect and you know use the right filter to project this one image don't think about the fact that all the other images that they're looking at are working just as hard to make their lives look perfect. Yeah, there's people who use filters to make their pictures look better than they otherwise might, you know. Um, like there was this Facebook 10-year challenge where it's like, oh, here's the picture of me 10 years ago. Here's the picture of me now. And it's like, okay, yeah, we can tell you put a filter on that. You just have a better phone exactly. now than you had 10 years ago, you know. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly right. But I do think that it's, this study suggests that we need to really be monitoring our teens because if depression is a factor, we want to intervene quickly. And, and you hear this too, you know, I mentioned that here in Montana, we've got such a, a bad problem with, with suicide and we've seen unfortunate tragic cases with teens and, and social media use has been mentioned in some of these cases uh, because, and, and, and usually what, how it gets mentioned is people say, well, that's, uh, that was such a shock because it looks like this perfect, this person is so happy and, and has this perfect life because they're, you know, you see all of this perfect life that's displayed on Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook. Um, but in reality, that's just, an, they're, they're, you know, it's, that's not the real picture that they're feeling inside. Exactly. I mean, I think that we can look at Robin Williams as a perfect example. He was always laughing and making everybody else laugh, but deep inside, he was really suffering. And so I think that's what we have to keep in mind. But it's interesting because research is showing that over half of our adolescents say that they've been bullied online, and over 25% of them say it's been a repeated offense. But only one in 10 of them are sharing this with their parents. Yeah. So what are the red flags to watch out for? What are the preventive measures that parents can do? I mean, just integrating it into your conversation saying, hey, look, don't don't believe everything you see on Facebook. And just just you just got to reground kids. You can bring them back down to back down to the ground level, I guess. Right. Well, you do. But the other thing is that as parents, we really need to be modeling appropriate behavior for them. You know, we need to be sharing when, when we've compared ourselves to other people and realized, you know what, it's not all that and more. But with our teens, we need to be looking to see if there's any changes in their behavior, whether or not there's changes in their sleep patterns, in their appetite patterns, 
or if they're not spending as much time with friends or things that they previously enjoyed. And a big one is, is there a change in their school attendance or performance? If we're seeing more than a couple of those, those are really big red flags. All right, Dr. Michelle Bankson, a neuropsychologist. Uh, thanks for joining us here on Montana Talks. Yeah, this uh, you know this uh, a huge huge issue out there that uh, may go undetected unless people are aware of it. Yeah, we we just need to stay vigilant. That's for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Appreciate you being with us. Anytime, Aaron. All righty.